thank you everybody for being here, for those who are here present and those who are virtually with us and will be with us. It is an absolute pleasure to introduce Anthony Blatchard, the CEO of Herasoft. And uh, we thank you, Anthem, to be here. And thank you, and Jose and Matt for uh, Radical Companies and the Radical Movement and the rest of uh, the followers of Society 2045. Anthem, I'm going to start right, right into it. So you work in cybersecurity. What is that? Cybersecurity is how we can protect commerce is, is what it is. So all commerce runs on computers and digital internet. Of course, we know all of this inherently. And in order for us to buy and sell goods and services from each other, we have to protect our systems. And that's really what cybersecurity is, is protecting our, our commercial systems. So you, you, thank you. So you got to hear uh, by, by looking at how we work at society. What do you think happened? How, how, how did we get here? And then we're going to ask, how do we get out of it? <laughs> well, I, I, I would suggest a, a, a culmination or not quite a culmination yet, unfortunately, of, of violence that has been inherent in our commercial way of being. And I know we've talked about this before and, and the idea that I, I look at our existence as human beings as a function of commerce and socialization in order for us to procreate to exist. And I believe that we're not evil by nature, but I believe that our commercial incentive structures have been what we might consider evil in the sense that lying, cheating, killing, and, and stealing, killing um, have all been the predominant winning ways of commerce for as long as history has been known. It's, it's not been corruptible, of course, um, and I think that that's been the biggest problem and biggest challenge. So I think that's how um, we got to this very scary point of, um, you know, just we probably could all sit here and come up with ways of killing ourselves and each other and probably sit here for, you know, many days and still continue to come up with new ways. I mean, that that's that's really the, the state of the fragility that we have, I think. And um, I think we it's really like a, a great time of self reflection right how, how can we how can we persist in a way where flow and voluntary uh and and, and, and peaceful methods of of commerce can can succeed and and i think the solution is going to be anchoring commerce to trustable incorruptible record keeping and i think that's where the conversation moves into bitcoin and other public protocols and we're 13 years into the the uh, adventure and the event invention that is public protocols and and really the ability to have perfect databases, perfect record keeping that has so far proven to be incorruptible. And um, I think that we're in um, an ongoing uh, a saga and an adventure, um, and we're all really, I think, lucky enough. Some could maybe say unlucky enough to be alive right now in this challenge of. How do we cross the chasm um, from violent uh, commerce and to peaceful commerce? And, and I think that um, we, we, we all have um, a, a lot of weight on our shoulders based on all of our knowledge and relative um, you know, experience. And, and you know, just this amazing group of people, as I'm starting to you know, just get to understand it, but just the idea that you have this looking forward society, right? And you're, you're really your future looking and you wanna as good of a present and future as possible. That to me is the best articulation of all, right? So, um, you know, I'm honored really. It's, uh, you know, thank you for sharing your time with me and, uh, you know, happy to, happy to share any insights that I might be able to provide based on some of my background. So um, yeah, thank you. Um, I, ha I have a couple of questions, but I wanted to open it up and see if anybody has any comments before I continue. I can't help myself because yeah. Yeah, that was <laughs> that was good. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so yeah, no, thank you because what you just said. It, I don't tend to use the word commerce, um, uh, but relationships. 
And it's one in the same, isn't it? Right. Exactly. It's Socialization, commerce, procreation. And, and actually, I think spirituality, I think these are all inherent. It's just we've only really supposedly known commerce by way of force and spirituality by way of force because violence has necessitated our commerce and we've had to forgive ourselves and each other for our violent ways that have necessitated commerce all because of the fear of the unknown. The violence comes from the fear. The fear comes from the unknown the, because trust is a one or a zero, right? It's binary and it always rounds down. And when something is potentially corruptible, we our game theory and how we act toward ourselves and others for our perceived instinct of survival is fear because we have to assume the worst because we can't, we, 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 we don't know. We don't know what the other side is thinking, right? And we, we, we have imperfect information basically that's acting as an oracle or a source. And, and, and this is now totally gonna be able to shift. It's just very early days. All software that commercializes is, quote unquote, a stack of layers of software pieces. You know, we can think of it metaphorically, like almost any uh, good or service that we use is a, a layering of, of multitudes of goods and services that combine before they're ultimately served as a product or service. And, um, you know, software is, is, is extremely like that. It, it's always stocks and layers and so um you know private protocols for example which is another type of network software were created you know about 30 years before they commercialized so the internet really commercialized private protocols fully like email protocols like smtp or pop or imap or you know website protocols like https right so it, um, you know, it, it took many decades for these protocols to basically get out of, um, you know, pre-commercialization, even once they were stocked and, and you know, configurations like email, for example. So, um, you know, I think that that in mind, Bitcoin invented public, pro creators invented public protocols for the first time 13 years ago. And, you know, now we're, we're in the process of seeing the assembly of a distributed virtual machine. So, you know, the kind of like what we saw with open source central stack software creating these central virtual machines that we have today, obviously, and we're all talking on right now the benefit, right? Um, you know, we're, we're, we're moving to distributed virtual machines as the next scaling of the internet, the cloud, um, you know, networking, communication. So um, it, it's a necessary scaling because now the the threat actors are are, are persisting at a level that's un, unsustainable economically to persist with um, central cloud basically is what's happened over the last um, eight years especially you know it's uh, basically coincided with the advent of public protocols because public protocols eliminate human administrators. So unlike private protocols, right, like an email protocol or a website protocol that requires a human being to add and remove permissions, basically, the software keys serve as the administrator for Bitcoin, Ethereum, or other public protocols. Um, so the utility for Bitcoin, for example, is the world's strongest clock. Uh, for Ethereum, it's the world's strongest computer processor, for example. Um, other other layers are, are, are vying for um, world's strongest uh, hard drive, for example. So what we're in the midst of seeing are um, the the hardening of you know our, our our kind of initial stock and like one of the things that our company Harris Harrisoft, not to promote us, but um, we have been developing first as a retail company for about nine years in the space, about thirteen. Um, so that's kind of how we got our hands dirty, basically kind of being plumbers, electricians and building mainly marketing promotional items because this whole space still is pre uh, market commercialization, right? So um, it really has had to have been total speculative um, up until now, even still, but yeah. it took, 
two trillion dollar plus liquid speculative market. Um, so that shows us, you know, the indicator of the perceived value, right, that the market is placing, and you know, assuming that this distributed virtual machine stock will get created, and that you know others will likely then be created once the first one gets created. So, um, you know, very much like we've seen other innovations and. In, in this public protocol space, right? So um, it's very exciting. Um, I'm happy to share again, you know, we're really lucky. Um, we actually have, I think the easiest time relative to our, um, you know, other, you know, uh, fellows out there and, and uh, people that are basically working in our space and that because of our longevity and Sadly, um, because it's a hyper speculative space, just like all the other hyper speculative spaces before it is is wrought, uh, fraught with fraud because lying, cheating, stealing, killing is still the economic way because this way this new way hasn't evolved yet. Right. So commerce hasn't yet anchored into these new incorruptible layers. So it really does make more economic sense, sadly, for people to basically steal and grab and leave and 99 out of 100 cases over the last 10 years, we've roughly seen that, I would say, as an individual, but that's to be expected. But um, fortunately, because we didn't do that, um, we have access to just unbelievable mind share talent and, you know, very obscure new type of programming languages and people that are typical lone wolf types that, you know, really are uncomfortable because of getting screwed over, basically. Um, will, you know, join a group with us, you know, and, and be part of our team. So, um, you know, it's a very exciting, exciting space, but just like all very early spaces, it's uh, very dangerous. Um, it's, 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 um, there's a lot of um, uh, asymmetric information. And, and so, you know, because there isn't a lot of public protocols, even still taught in universities, let alone, you know, high schools and middle schools, lower schools. I mean, it's uh, in, in the workforce. I mean, none of this software is commercial yet. It's not like Fortran or Cobalt or Linux or Mongo or whatever, Java, or any of these things, right? Like they're, they're, the, these languages are you know, some of them, you know, are legacy languages, but like the languages then built into these protocols are, they're, they're all basically looking for potential commercial applicability. So that's, um, you know, the fun, you know, but also the challenge, right? So anyway, so um, that's, that's kind of where we're at, which I think is really positive. It's very optimistic relative to the world because um, it looks like things are so negative in the world, but Actually, I think we're right around the corner from violent commerce obsoleting. Like I, I think in, you know, the, it's society 2045. And I think by 2045 that we're gonna obsolete violent commerce. I don't think it's gonna exist any longer. I don't think it's no longer gonna serve us. Cause if, you know, if we persist based on our, our spiritual, commercial, societal, you know, livelihood and be able to procreate livelihood then we just follow those incentive structures i mean it's very much the same as why did everyone start adopting an iphone you know it did no one really forced anybody but people just did better cheaper faster it's the same thing here ultimately we need to you we need to order from amazon right we need to pay our bills like we need to do banking or <clears throat> excuse me, finance. And ultimately, how do we do those things? We have to access the internet, right? We have to access our digital world. And so this world is a, is a world that is um, right now constructed in a serial way. So in other words, like how our old school Christmas lights were like 30 years ago, or how, you know, houses were electrified a hundred years ago or buildings or, you know, early electrification. Mm -hmm. If one socket or one outlet or something went out, everything went out in the building, right? And yeah, it was just unbelievably inefficient, right? But then eventually we went to parallel networking, right? Well, 
and software unbelievably these connections like api connections for example i mean it's one system to another system and then the clouds it's one central organization running the cloud so they're actually it's one-to-one -one connections they're serial connections and that's why there's all of these issues the the issues have always existed is the truth it's just that only until more recently again it hadn't been for 30 years plus prior to that that the banking system had a monopoly on digital payments. And so databases have been broken into since they were invented, but the those that had broken in were just basically monetizing the data theft effectively in all kinds of different ways. And that's just, that's been going on for half a century, you know, but now basically what's happened in the last eight years is the banking system lost its monopoly on digital payments. And that's opened the floodgates to bounties. So, I mean, really like from a societal standpoint, from like the early nineties up until about 2013, um, it was basically like well, ransoms, kidnapping ransoms, system ransoms were basically non-existent or, you know, very small scale. And then basically what happened is once the software keys, these public protocols gained you know, tens of billions and hundreds of billions of dollars of value, now trillions of dollars worth of liquid value, it provided threat actors with the ability to collect bounties and effectively ransom systems, basically to hold computer systems hostage effectively in different ways. And that is what we've seen proliferate and the viciousness of the attacks just escalate and the proliferation of the attacks are just escalating because the truth of the matter is, is the attacks are getting easier and easier for people to find how to do. I mean, there was a story I was reading a couple months ago about school kids in Britain that were denial of service attacking their school. I mean, like, right. I mean, it's gotten to this kind of level where, you know, a 10 year old can literally with access to a phone like know how to DDoS infrastructure potentially. I mean, what happens if it's, you know, a situation where, you know, it's a poverty stricken family, you know, and the kid, you know, their parents are working, you know, hundreds of hours every week or something crazy, you know, a month, you know, they're nonstop working. And, you know, there's, there's the ability that the child perceives that, you know, that by ransoming some, you know, little town in the U.S.'s, you know, hospital or something that they basically can collect enough money that their parents never have to work again, right? I mean, these are, as we have more and more income and inequality and more and more access to the internet at the same time, you know, you know, more and more wealth disparity with more and more access, these scenarios are all, all you know, going to happen more. It, it's, it's, it, it goes away from state actors and big corporate actors, which have been basically the biggest threats effectively in my viewpoint, or like big syndicates, you know, big organized crime, whatever, you know, but big syndicates of all sorts going to basically lone wolves. I mean, you know, that, that it, you don't have to have groups anymore and big resources and things anymore. And, um, you know, that's the, that's the, that's the stick, right? <laughs> that's the, ah, you know, the, the chicken little, the sky is falling, you know, but the way that our systems are serially connected is that they don't require access keys right now to access a computer that's broken into. So the threat actors break into computers and then basically are able to steal somebody else's hardware and then use the software against basically someone else effectively. So there, there's a total unfair advantage the threat actor has with the way that our systems are constructed because none of the networks require any kind of like software key, for example, mm -hmm. to access them. So mm -hmm. it's like a tragedy of the commons, basically, that inflicts all of these networks of networks on the internet. So it's kind of like that scene in the matrix when all those like machines are coming into the roof. I think it's the last one. And they're like trying to get them all the little machine looking bug things, but they can't, it's too many. That's like a, that's like the denial of service attack right there. And so 
it's too much. It's a flood. It's a flood of a system. The neat thing about these software keys to like Bitcoin, Ethereum, these public protocols is that their economic barriers of entry and their unique identifiable unforgeable software key. So unlike an RSA key, for example, or some kind of public private key encryption that once the threat actor is able to compromise, steal basically the algorithm that is running basically whatever the thing is that creates the RSA or equivalent key, Right, so this can't be done with Bitcoin, basically. So, um, oh, it looks like someone might have a question. Yeah. yeah. So, so um, Anthem, I'm kind of a student of languages, and by that I don't mean you know French, Russian, German. What I mean by is when you're working in a domain, um, there's a certain language that allows you to converse intelligently. So I practiced law for about 10 years. And, and when I started in 1972, legal language was kind of esoteric. You know, lawyers could talk in a way that nobody could understand. And I predicted about 25 years ago that this was going to happen with technology. So I, I, I have an inkling of what you're saying but I'm still not sure because there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of assumptions that you're making about uh, me understanding what it is that you're talking about. So uh, what I'd like to do as a grounding piece is can you, can you pretend that you're talking to someone who landed from Mars or a five-year-old and explain to me what Bitcoin actually is and and how it works and it's not like i'm a um uh, what's the word uh uh when somebody doesn't know anything about a particular area luddite thank you it's not like i'm a technology luddite at all right um i know enough but i i would just love to hear what's behind the things that you're that you're saying yeah, thank you. So just to really simplify, so Bitcoin is a piece of software. So that's that's all it is. It's it's one layer of software. And we're not used to like unless we're actually unless and I'm not a software developer myself, but and even software developers aren't used to seeing a single layer of software typically. Um, it's like a raw material. Um, like it's like an element on the periodic table. It's like dealing with a, you know, a, a, a single substance effectively. So Bitcoin is a single layer of software and it's a type of software that's called protocol software. And, and this type of software, protocol software has existed for decades. It's how the internet exists basically, um, for example, and like how e email exists, for example, they're all chassis, if, if you will, based you know, foundationally on these uh, protocol type software. Protocol software, of course, you know, protocol language, right, rules. Um, so it's a network software. It's software that's secured and served through a network. And as long as uh, the network of a protocol software holds, um, then there's 100% uptime effectively within that network. And that's why, you know, the network of the internet always is up even when there's really cataclysmic events that might damage really you know big major central points but there's enough redundancy effectively in the internet even with all of its centralization that it has a tremendous amount of resiliency right, so, so how how will how will bitcoin um how and why will bitcoin versus traditional facilitation of commerce um how will it how will it how will it change and move um transactions into a more positive spiritual way to use your to use your your words well thank you um thank you for your curiosity and so i my my guess my hypothesis is that um we as humanity will anchor 
are commercial transaction timestamps and signatures of our commercial agreements into the database that the Bitcoin software saves, which is thus far proven to be the hardest, most impossible to edit or change or delete database in the world. Um, and so that's effectively Bitcoin's sole utility, as I can see from a commercial perspective, will be as the world's strongest clock, the world's strongest timestamp. So as I, un as I understand it, um, I feel like I'm a lawyer doing cross-examination. Yeah, it's great. These are amazing questions. <laughs> what a, what I think you are. As I understand it, the, the value is that it's what's called a distributed database. In other words, it's not housed in one particular place, but it's got pieces everywhere. So that's why it provides a, a higher level of security well said for, for commercial for commercial transactions yeah i think that's really well said that that's that's an excellent communication of the value proposition but also it's uncorruptible absolutely you and know I can track exactly where it came from at what time and and that makes so so that makes it uncorruptible and what i what i find fascinating about this is that now probably for the first time in history, we have technology that is influencing transparency and therefore that's influencing behavior. And that's where I wanted to get to um, in this conversation, how, how is technology changing our behavior? And then one of the things that we do at Society 2045 is how do we have a better way of managing teams? And when I heard Anthem talk the first time, I said, oh, this is a way that you can also use uh, transparency to change behavior. And that I think that's going to affect everybody's behavior. So I wanted to hear your, your opinion about that, Anthem. I, I think it's really beautifully said. And, and I look at things like a, a, a fade, a transition, an integration, not a migration, not a cliff. And I think that the ability to start commercializing these uh, you know, totally trustworthy um, layers of software um, will enable us to function commercially in smaller and smaller and smaller collutive groups. Because today, all of our commerce is 100% collutive groups. We have to form groups of association, archetypes, cults of personality, culture. We have to form associations as a protective measure. And so I see uh, being able to have smaller and smaller sized companies, the reason being is that we'll have more and more and more third party trust amongst us. So we won't require these big centralized silos as much as we have basically to basically garner as much perceived trust as possible, which has been the dominant commercial model, right? Get as big as you can, you know, bigger is better, right? Bigger gives you more scale. And, and it's always about predatory pricing, stuffing the channel, you know, basically lying on KPIs or manipulating KPIs relative to different, you know, equity or liability stakeholders. And these have been the tactics at commerce that have had to be the winning tactics because else competitors do that to, 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 the, to the other that doesn't. And so it's kill or be killed, right? Lie, cheat, steal, kill, Hammurabi, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, Sun Tzu, art of war. They've all been sadly, in my yeah, obviously for all of us, morally tactics, but, it, but they've necessitated our existence. Without these tactics, none of us would be existing likely because we have to commerce, to socialize, to procreate, but we've just only been able to commerce violently the reason I think this kind of makes sense to in, in a kind of other mathematical way is that we basically about 13 years ago kind of ran out of room on earth to hide from our violent ways. I mean, we became so violent that we could create viruses and vaccines and bombs and neutron bombs and space things that we shoot at each other and put it in our food and our air. We're killing each other and ourselves in all these different ways now. 
that we literally you know, couldn't hide. The majority of us can no longer hide from the fallout of the violence of our commerce. You know, when you see it in all our birth rates declining, our, all of these things, right? You know, death rates now, you know, the age expectancy is going down in the US in a lot of places. I mean, it's, you can see it. There's all of these things, you know, all of these indicators, Moore's law having trouble keeping up, right? All of these indicators that we see that commerce is, is not keeping up and that we have to basically shift. So, you know, I, I view Bitcoin as cathartic in that the basis of cryptography that is kind of the basis of Bitcoin was formed in the late 1970s officially as ways to secure US military and allied weaponry, effectively codes like nuclear bomb codes and things. And it's kind of a beautiful paradoxical, maybe cathartic, thing that here's maybe the same technology being used to basically solve world peace, right? By simply making commerce trustable, you know, you know, switching the incentive structure from distrust to trust, basically all of a sudden shifts our behavior from violent to peaceful. Because if we can view that commerce is actually at, you know, the crux commerce, spirituality, but commerce for sure is part of that, you know, part of that part of that crux of our existence, then it's just about what's our best way to commerce, right? And, and we've just, we've, I think we figured it out finally, because we had to. Well, I think we're still looking for that, but uh, Liv, uh, Catherine, that, that's the purpose of life, I guess. <laughs> Some questions. Yeah, hi. Um, so I'm not sure what my question is exactly, but I'd like to play devil's advocate just to okay. kind of help pull out some of the points a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. Um, because, hmm, right now, what we are experiencing is just this huge force of force and fear and military, et cetera, pop uh, populism, et cetera, et cetera, right? Yeah. And I'm not, while, I agree that there's a potential for Bitcoin or the blockchain for the transparency, right? I, there was just an article I read in the last week through my very limited reading source, New York Times, but the thread really blew apart Ethereum and some of the, I'm just gonna say bad actors that got involved with this. And also there's a lot, there's like, stories about nfts and how i'm just going to say generally how bad actors are getting involved with some of those things and creating of their own little ruckus right yep so i'm not sure my question but i just like kind of your thinking of how these initial um bad actors as we all are getting used to this and some clever people, but also those looking to take advantage of others are getting involved with some of the early, early technology. Um, maybe I'll just leave it at that. I hope that you understand what I'm trying yeah, to add. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's no, 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 no. I, 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 I totally hear what you're saying and it's totally true. I mean, like, as I prefaced, you know, 99 out of 100 groups the last decade that we've nine years of the last 10 years, we've been actively involved as a company building different types of solutions, mainly for ourselves the first seven years and then the last two years, mainly for other people in public protocol. So, I mean, I've spoken on, you know, Bloomberg West, you know, I've spoken all kinds of crazy places, you know, Maria Bartiromo, Fox Business on these subjects you know, years ago, right, five years ago kind of thing. So I totally am sensitive to this topic because it hurts me uh, tremendously, you know, commercially, ultimately, and because it hurts our companies, because it hurts our, our, our space's reputation. And, you know, it, it, it reminds me a lot of the 90s and the internet, especially, where, you know, there were a lot of, quote unquote, bad actors, you know, and, and there were a lot of, quote unquote, bad actions that basically got the internet really commercialized to begin with. And there was a lot of people like, you know, the dot-com boom being a like stereotypical, like people using 
asymmetric information to get you know outsized gains in all of this rampant speculation basically on shifting of commerce which turned out to be true yeah, so let just, me just let me just kind of throw in that as you as you cited these other I'm going to call them hiccups, like never go for version 1.1, let it mature a little bit. There's a lot of maturing that needs to happen. I mean, do you feel that with, um, you know, the blockchain and the promise of it, that it also has to go through some rough times before it can, I don't, and I'm not enough of a technologist to know if the technology needs to mature because that certainly is technology's problem. It needs to, it always needs to mature, but there's also a societal aspect to it of the people of how we come together to use it. And we all need that killer application. I mean, yeah, yeah, I, 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 which I, I don't know that if they found it yet because the NFTs, there's just too much, you can throw too many rotten tomatoes at that. Right. So I'm again. I'm just kind well, of it's, you know it's, just want to push it's, the conversation a little bit. No, no, no. I I, I love it because I I totally I I agree with everything you just said, and and I, I think that at the I, and and I agree with it, and I think it's critical for the evolution of the space to become completely commercialized. So, like the NFT, the power of the NFT is that it's just another entry in a database. However. It's a unique identifying marker in a database that has a lifetime database history. So long as the network that it's being secured upon, which is going to be a public protocol like Ethereum, for example, of course, is the most well known because it's the most uh, valued with these NFT markers, basically, you can think of them as. Um, but those same NFT markers are super useful for inventory, for example, or being able to deal with credentialing for ID security, for example. So what we see basically applied in these totally speculative ways, which in some ways is still indirectly commercially relatable, because really the best value so far, I would argue, globally has been remittance and store of value as a form of rampant speculation of the software keys of public protocols, right? Like people buying Satoshis, right? BTC or people buying, you know, Ether, ETH, right? The software keys to Bitcoin or Ethereum respectively, that it's the speculation drives more curiosity, drives more brain power, drives more innovation. Like DeFi is another great example, very, very immature. And these are innovations that are on single layers of software. And so again, just the history of all commercialization of software is stacks of software, layers of software basically that combine. There's you know, front end, there's a back end part with the database basically connecting it effectively. How do you connect that to the network effectively? What is, you know, what does it look like on the front end to the user? How, how does that interact? And so, you know, what is the administration of that basically from whoever you know is is serving that commercial service basically so um i i would say that there are insufficient uh critical commercial layers of a distributed virtual machine yet for the maturation of public protocols commercially yet we still lack i think a hard drive definitively like there's a layer called ipfs that's been proven to be really good, but I don't think it's quite kind of solidified yet necessarily. And there is versioning that does happen effectively with these protocol layers. And they tend to version a little bit less and less and less over time because kind of there's less incentive. Typically it seems like to a version over time. Again, it's, it's a 13 year experiment because it, we're still pre-commercialization and, and that's that's the excitement and that's also the, 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 the challenge and cost in this space. Like we've been a decade early to market timing and it's been very um, time expensive for us, right? As you know, but at the same time, it's allowed me and our team to be in a space basically as like a startup, you know, then to kind of early stage retail invest investment, e-retailer, e precious metal platforms that we built for our, our company to basically allow us to experiment enough as it turned out um, and still be early to, to commerce basically with these layers. So um, 
you know, you bring up great question and your great points. Um, and I think they're all valid. And I think, you know, it's like anything, you know, staying curious and like staying informed and using common sense, like will get you the longest way that, you know, in terms of being successful, you know, as it relates to the public protocol world, you know, and anything related to it. So, um, you know, your points are totally valid. Like just to give you, you know, like insights. I mean, we're, we were talking with the museum here locally and, you know, they have relationships with Christie's and, you know, the, the, this person was very skeptical um, about NFTs. And then he contacted Christie's and they were like, I know, but we're selling like crazy amounts of these NFT arts right now. That doesn't mean that, you know, there's fads and things like that, but um, I, I, I think that, you know, even in the concept of art, you know, and, and as a really a store of value concept, like art really is in, 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 in a lot of ways, um, you know, I think that there's a lot of validity to it because the artist gets rewarded. And it, I think it also validates the thesis that we're moving from, you know, multi-millennia era of distributors and commerce having the complete power, pricing power and control and commerce through distribution to now the creators, the artists, the artisans, the producers having the power because now value can be perfectly judged because we have perfect data integrity now in that all these public protocols represent the makings of automating and commoditizing ultimately our distribution channels and systems. And so, you know, the Walmarts and the Amazons will totally flatten ultimately, as will all companies and corporations, as will all governments, because all of these are constructs of forced marketplaces. And once force is eliminated as the incentive structure of commerce, all of those structures go away and become irrelevant to us. How so? Because we act upon our need of commerce, I would argue, and governments and countries, I would argue, are forced marketplaces. And once we no longer require force in our marketplaces, then we'll turn strictly to voluntary marketplaces, which I think public protocols I will evolve to. And I know others need to speak, but it's also kind of interesting to take it out of the realm of something that of art and some of these objects, which are, are not needed and into what does it need to go into, put it into objects and things that we, that are needed. It's, I think it's an evolutionary market. Anyway, I know that others, I, Jose I, I, and Matt, have been, said. had their I, I, hand raised. So. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I, I thank a, you. Sorry. What, I, sorry I was so long on that. But yeah. Yeah. What's, a, what's a forced marketplace? Um, so really, a, a forced marketplace is when someone is required to abide by the laws. So like, for example, if I travel to another country, but I'm not a resident or citizen, I'm still forced to adhere to their laws. That's a forced marketplace. And the laws are, are of force. They take away our time and our value, basically material values as well. Um, so there's retribution. There's always violence involved in this. It's, it's taking away something uh, as opposed to just not being able to participate, which is different. So with... Uh, potential voluntary marketplace where you just required mathematical keys to enter and, and access the commercial utilities effectively. There's no judgment other than does the math work? There's no human administration required. There's no cult of personality, discriminatory enforcement, right? It's kind of like, you know, does, you know, uh, royalty in the UK get the same legal treatment you know, as someone who's not a royal, obviously not, but are they supposed to? Yeah, they're supposed to, but they don't. And everyone another example that, of right? that, my, sorry, Anthony, I, I was yeah. going to say another example of that might be the idea that, um, you know, each time we download a piece of software um, in whatever ecosystem it is, we are forced to sign an agreement if we want to use that, that. And we have no ability to negotiate in those terms nor do we have the, the privilege or the, um, the wherewithal to make yeah. that happen, right? Right, because we require the scale and the economies of scale have always come through mass centralization. 
but I would argue that we peaked mass the centralization, at least as we know it today, and we're now turning to distributed type commercial systems. That, that's what I think that Bitcoin and public protocols and this $2 trillion liquid market cap in 13 years represents. I don't yeah. think it represents a Ponzi scheme. I don't think it represents a fad or something, you know, or uh, a, a total, you know, speculation that will never achieve any kind of direct commercial utility. I think it will be directly commercially useful. Not the vast majority of the public protocols, I don't think will be because there's probably millions of them today. But I think that, you know, Bitcoin for sure will. Um, and the other, and I think Ethereum has a good shot, but you know, and the other ones, I think, yeah, it's, it's speculative. Um, totally. I, I uh, just to back you up on that one, I uh, started a business in 95, an internet business. It got acquired by a uh, newspaper uh, corporation up in, in uh, Canada and talking to all the publishers around the country, most of them would say, well, you know, it's the internet. It's just, this is all just going to disappear. It's all a joke. None of this is going to really matter. Of course, most of them are underwater now um, if they haven't been closed down completely. Um, but if I may, and it's as much a question as it is uh, a statement, I think the questions that Stuart and, and uh, Catherine have asked and, um, and we've been kind of tossing around here your focus is on the technology, but you did start talking about the fact that it's really about the fact that human relationships, my terminology, not yours, but I think they're one and the same, yeah. require uh, that we have a smoother way to integrate with one another. And that when, when, whenever we've had this centralized mechanism of companies with greater and greater power, of governments with greater and greater power, of um, institutions of one kind or another with greater and greater power. What happens is, yes, it serves us better in that they're able to reach more people, they're able to have econom economies of scale and all that kind of stuff, but it also hurts us more because we are less and less connected to the very thing that we're getting. Yeah. Exactly. Overconsumption, overproduction is a necessity. And this is why, again, why are we at where we're at? Because of, you know, all of the incentive of corruption of commerce. I think. Yeah, yeah Matt's got a hand and I'm going to shut up. The question that that um, we we ask at some point is, OK, so given that your best dreams come through, <laughs> everything you talk about comes through and we all become you know, we all transform and all that. What does 2045 look like? So, you know, we, yeah, the flying car takes me to my, takes me to my house and <laughs> I alight and it takes off and it parks in the sky somewhere. What else, what's, why, are we, why are we alive? Yeah. You know, like, well, there's a okay. good chance that we're gonna be dead. Otherwise, why are we so, alive? I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, we all have to have, thank you, thank you. What, what, what a curious question, you know, why are we alive? And I ask myself that a lot too. And I think, first of all, I think that we're quantum computers and that, you know, once we are out of our perpetual trauma-based stress state that we will naturally align with one another in a one state because it will be to our advantage and we will no longer be threat vectors against one another anymore. We'll just have to worry about everything else in the universe. <laughs> so not each other finally. You know, we can actually, you know, coexist because that's what our commercial incentive will enable. So I think 2045, we will be at that point. I think all third party automation, all Internet of Things requires universal trust layers, which means incorruptible layers of, of data that, you know, right, are, are, are a one, are oneness. And I only see public protocols right now being able to achieve that in a la layered, like all software stocked. And, and I think that it will enable, you know, total automation in all transport. I think all, I don't know if it's going to be quite 2045, but maybe close that all rote work will be non-existent, like any kind of lifting or driving, any kind of repetitive, anything repetitive basically 
will no longer be done by a person. And that we're, we're going to be able to free ourselves to just be creative beings in that, you know, entrepreneurs and artists and, you know, uh, you know how we can collaborate, you know, music and these, you know, different artistic film and functions and, and all of these different, you know, formats of artistry and production and creativity will, will dominate effectively all of our actions and, and everything else will, you know, just basically be, you know, like for fun or a hobby or something basically. And that effectively work as we think of it today will no longer exist. So, um, so that, that's my vision also, uh, Anthem, but how is software gonna make that happen? Well, because we- I'm just the, not, get, I'm not, I'm not it's getting a, it. It's a tool, it's, right? It's, 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 software is just a, a, a syntax, right? Software is a language that allows us to have hardware, like, you know, physical things that we build, do things basically for us effectively if we want them to, right? So um, that's really what software does. Um, it powers hardware, really, and, you know, hardware, right, or like machinery we build basically for various functions. And so by having the software be trustworthy for the first time ever, it allows like Amazon or Walmart, for example, to go outside of their warehouse with automation onto the road, because whether it's a, you know, T-Mobile Android phone or a, you know, Apple iPhone connected to the whatever Volkswagen or the Tesla or whatever it is, the Ford or, you know, whatever it is, all these connections will be able to finally trust one another because there won't be a danger of the software being centrally hackable because there's no longer any central software to hack is basically it. It's, it's, eliminate, it's eliminating a central point of failure by distributing all the points that serve at the same time, basically. Um, it's like no single place to attack. So you have to attack everything at the same time. So it makes the attack so far impossible has been what's played out so far the last 13 years of this Bitcoin and public protocol experiment, basically. Um, where, where, I, where I see the value on this is uh, in uh, international trade. Like I come from Venezuela, we've wiped out 14 zeros of currencies in uh, I think 18 years. So I think there's gonna be some change. If you transfer money from one country to another, there's a lot of problems. And now it, it is not, now it is not. So I think this provides a better playing field to, uh, to a lot of people from developing countries like what he was saying, Anthem was saying about allowing creators. And one thing that we don't realize is that we're forced to train in dollars. And, you know, we live in, a, in the U.S. We don't and, 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 and that's another thing, actually. I believe that we're going to eliminate money as we think of it, because I believe money is a third party a conduit of value that has to be defined. And I believe any definition has to be defended, that definition in anything that is defendable, is aggressible and is violent. And I, I look at Satoshis that their currency for Bitcoin's public protocol are forms of barter, um, as are all these software, their software keys is what they are. So they're, they're software keys that power software. So you get direct access to the utility. Sometimes they're even backed by physical things. So you can even get access to a good directly. And so I think there was a question by uh, Catherine Yeager that um, the argument, we don't have the hardware computing power to fully power blockchain. So remember like when we think of a blockchain is basically a word for a public protocol that secures its own network. So that's a blockchain. Like there's some, like we created one called Hercules three and a half years ago that secures on Ethereum. So they call that a layer two. It's not a blockchain. It's just a public protocol. So um, you can basically secure these public protocol networks by various means. It doesn't have to just be like Bitcoin or like right now Ethereum, although they're moving away the network it looks like from this type of security by pure brute electricity and energy, basically powering and securing the network. There's other, other methods basically, like Bitcoin's way is typically referred to as proof of work. Like there has to be some kind of computational work 
which then needs obviously a computer to run, which then needs energy, as opposed to like what Ethereum is right now in the process of moving to, and it looks like they're gonna successfully migrate to a type of network security called proof of stake, which is basically how many of these software keys do you hold? And on that basis, basically, there's uh, more authority to basically be a security, uh, a, a way to secure the network, basically. It's a, a node or a validator, basically, um, uh, because there basically needs to be all of these nodes that house the databases. They're basically all of these computers that house the database and that the software is able to access all of this information, basically, as like one gigantic cluster. And that's the power, right? Think of it, think of like the power of a gigantic spider web type of a mechanism versus like just a single, just a single thread, right? You know, of the same substance, right? So that's that's the power basically in the parallel networking, right? Of anything, you know, you, you get mass, you can get mass redundancy. Whereas with serial networks, you, you can never get you can never get redundancy, let alone mass redundancy. So um, thank you. I think uh, we we are past the hour. Yeah, very close to past the hour. Um, and this has been really uh, an interesting and very technology driven conversation. I think we need an appendix now, uh, uh, very different to the conversations we have. Um, I wanted to thank you, uh, Anthem, for coming here. I wanted to thank all the participants. I I want to say if um, I want to ask if you have the last uh, um, suggestion for us in order to be better prepared to be in a better society in 2045. I'd like to hear that. You know, a group thinking about society, I think it's also really, really critical to think about commerce and in terms of like the betterment of oneself in the present while thinking about the future, which I think yet still we're betting on our curiosity. So no, anyway, so thank you all. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Anthem. Yeah. Thank you everybody for being here. All right. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alicia and everybody. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Have a great, wonderful day and weekend. And thanks for spending so much time with me.